Hey everybody, welcome to a special XR talk. We are going to be talking with Lida Liberopoulou. She's currently working on creating an open, fully explorable and interactive VR world for cultural heritage. She's consulted on large telco and ISP projects in the past, but lately history and video games and VR worlds are all coming together into a really unique creation of Lida's. Lida happens to be the number one spot on Inside dot com's leaderboard, a testament to what a valuable part of the community she is and how much she contributes to conversations around XR and more. I hope you enjoy this fascinating conversation about all of the possibilities of a social VR. You're experimenting with a really interesting part of the creator economy. Can you tell us what platforms you're working on and what you're building? First of all, what I'm building is I reconstructed archaeological sites in VR and I reconstructed as they were in the past, not as they are right now. Because right now, most of the places I reconstruct are in ruins and in some cases are very difficult for people to understand exactly the space and how people traversed it, what was its function, because a lot of it is missing, is broken. So I use uh, um, historical uh, documentation and uh, recreation. For most of the archaeological sites you find in the world, usually there has been a specialist architects and historians that went through what remains and have tried to create reconstruction in detail in architectural designs of this space to understand how exactly those buildings were in the past. So what I do is I take this information and create 3D models and recreate the entire space, not just the buildings, but the entire space as it was in the past, one-to-one. -one. And I try to make it fully explorable, which means none of my buildings are facades. You are, can actually enter them. You can climb the stairs, look at the window, move around the rooms. That's the whole idea. And also I try to, to add props and anything else I can use to give the impression of a space that people lived in. The ideal situation for me is to create a space that contains such well-placed historical items that will give the impression of the person that enters it that the people who lived there were there 10 minutes ago and you just missed them. What platforms are you building on? Uh, the 3D engine I'm using is Unity. It's the game engine. The, the 3D models, I built almost every model in my world is built by me a very simple, low-poly design. Initially, my worlds were hosted in a platform called Altspace VR. Altspace VR was one of the oldest social VR platforms, which, unfortunately, on this year, March 10th, Microsoft, who had purchased two years before the uh, platform, decided to close it down and use its technology to use it on the new version of Teams. There is going to be a new version of Microsoft Teams that will have support for VR. So they already have a, a prototype version of Teams, which is a mix between Teams and Microsoft Mesh. And it's used only by large companies as a beta right now. So you can't access it. But in any case, the point is that this is gone. This platform is gone for users. Mm. It used to be a very nice community. It had actually, it was the place where during COVID, Burning Man, they, well, they had a Burning Man event oh. there. And th th it was held for two years there. And it was quite big and very good and wonderful art, by the way. They brought in three, as 3D models a lot of the art you would find in an actual Burning Man. Unfortunately, it's gone. So I had to move to another place. Two places that I have my work right now. One is VR Chat. VRChat is the largest social VR platform that exists right now. It's okay. really big. It's incredibly creative and has large communities in it. But the main issue with it is that it's an anarchic place. It's the price you get if you want creativity, if you leave everything fully free. You get weird stuff also happening in the platform. That's interesting. Which is, yes. So it's a place I have uploaded it there and I have some of my worlds. I have them now for almost three months. One of them got 1,000 visits, which is more than I had three years in Altspace. 
for one of mm -hmm. my worlds it's because it's so big. But on the other hand, I would be very reluctant to do, let's say, tours with a group of people in there because mm -hmm. the chances of a group of 13-year-olds yeah. running around and shouting is very high. But on the other hand, this is a very creative... If The most creative things you will find done in VR, some of the most creative are done in this platform. It's a, you okay. will find amazing stuff done there. So that's but, VR chat. What's the other yes. one? The other one is Spatial I.O. All the worlds you see there, you can just click on them through your browser and you will be transported inside the world and you can fully explore them. The reason I've used it's because in addition to VR, they have a mobile app and they allow people to visit through browser, which means it's very easy for me to send you a link and you can open a browser and just move around my space through your keyboard without having a headset. If you want to use a headset, you can also, but I can demo my world, my, my work very easy through Spatial IO. So that's a, also a good platform. And also they gradually expanded to put more interactivity, but the problem is, of course, it's a much smaller audience there and a much smaller community. And it's still an experimental stage in comparison to VRChat, which is an established platform that also provides far more flexibility when it comes to creating interactive experiences on it. But again, there is no Facebook for VR right now. Yeah. There is no Twitter for VR. There is not the platform where everybody can go there and have most of the tools they need to work and to show their work and utilize the platform for what they want. That doesn't ex exist right now. And it's a massive problem, actually, for hmm. people like me who want to create and monetize their work. It's right. inev inevitable that it will happen. Which platform do you think might consider acquiring a VR chat or a spatial IO? Is it going to be Facebook? <laughs> no, that's not their Facebook, demographic. Of, in my opinion, Facebook has its own attempt at the social VR platform. It's called Horizons. I managed to get into the beta. And although it has some interesting features, I don't want to be completely unfair to it. It has some interesting features when it comes to building some stuff. but it's so sterile and clean that it's a problem. That also applies to social VR platforms that aim to a professional audience, which Horizons is not that, but it suffers from the similar problem, which is being completely odorless and tasteless. In tasteless, in the sense it doesn't have any personality, it gives a lifeless sort of feel. The notorious image of Zuckerberg appearing inside this platform yeah. with uh, the Eiffel Tower behind him, that thing that became a meme, that's Horizons. Yeah. Do you think Horizons needs some sort of partnership like Alt Space VR had with Burning Man to establish their character or culture? I think it has to do a lot with Facebook's culture as a company. And also, as I told you, VRChat is an anarchic place that's also very creative, but very anarchic and a place that an established brand would not touch with a 10-foot pole Yeah, because of this anarchic nature of it. But nobody's bothering it, right? Nobody heard about it. Nobody's bothering it. Although it's easy to have a mob of people running around behind you shouting. But if even a 10 of that happens inside Horizons, there will be massive backlash from the media and yeah. because it's Facebook. Because Facebook has this terrible reputation and all the yeah. baggage that comes with it, people will not tolerate even the slightest thing happening there. Well, they will not bother at all in anything else that's, let's say, unknown or experimental. I don't know how Facebook can get there and become mm. a platform where people will feel comfortable exploring and experimenting in. I don't think they can do it both because of their reputation and because of their culture as a company. That's so interesting. I want to explore more of this niche of the creator economy that you're in, which is creating worlds. Is your world something that you would ever sell or is there an alternate route to profitability, say through Patreon? The 
Selling it would be the last resort for me. This is my creation. This is something that's very dear to me. I don't know if I would ever sell it. Let's say I don't know is the answer. The other revenue stream I could have, there was always this thought of selling land in the metaverse, which by the way, yeah. metaverse is a word I hate, which mm -hmm. for me is a completely bizarre concept because the idea of having a unique plot of land in a digital space is weird because what is the cool thing about a digital space is that you can have infinite copies of a thing. That's the cool thing about it. So the advantage that my space has, for example, compared to the real Acropolis, you can have only one Acropolis. And if you have 50,000 people a day that want to enter it, People are crammed on top of the hill because it's a small space. It's not the forum in Rome, which is massive. And you are there and you are supposed to go around that space and try to understand what's going on from the ruins around you with 10,000 other people just moving like this mm -hmm. with people around you. If you are in the digital space, you can have 10,000 copies of the Acropolis at the same time and you can have only one person in it, mm -hmm. 30 or a thousand if they want to be a thousand inside the version of Acropolis for whatever reason. That's the advantage you have in virtual worlds. The other thing that was an experiment I did, I got people to pay me money and buy a ticket to do a tour. So That's I cool. did guided tours inside my space. And what's the advantage of this? Okay, one person doing a tour, that's not exactly the massive revenue stream, right? But if you have, let's say, 10,000 versions of the Acropolis and equally inside of them, historians or people who want to do tours, doing mm -hmm. guided tours and getting paid for this, and you get a cut from that's one way of doing it. You need to right. be a licensed guide to do a tour in the Acropolis and get paid for it. If you are in a virtual world, Nobody bothers whether you are a licensed yeah. guide. You can be a historian. You can be an art uh, historian, an actual classical historian. You, be, you can be anyone who wants to do a tour and nobody's going to bother you because why? There maybe is a credentialing problem there. I couldn't see this being a huge part of the virtual worlds that exist in the future, the ability to have someone guide you through this immersive 3D space. But maybe there's going to be a whole new school that is credentialing for sure. tours of 3D spaces. So you're based in Greece and obviously Greece. Greece and Rome have a very close history. So yes. Where did your interest in this spark from? I always had it. Ancient history is the thing I always loved. And my initial degree was in archaeological conservation, which is the science of putting back together and cleaning and restoring all the objects you find in museums. After this, I also did a degree in computer science to combine these two. And the time has come to combine these two. And this is the result. This is the result <laughs> you get. It's all coming together. The next step is create interactive experiences in these worlds that teach people. You can have NPCs, non-playable characters inside these worlds that through AI, you can have a discussion with them as if they were real people. You are not limited by having a narrative that has been written and is limited by how much of it you have developed and coded in the game. The discussion is not limited to how many audio lines you have created and they put in the game because yeah. it's created on the spot as you talk to the NPC through AI. This is and a great application of AI chatbots. Yes. And also there's an additional thing. Usually in video games, this is done through, let's say you approach character, you click on them and you get a text that says, hello, or the character starts talking with audio, but you get the text and then options of what you can answer back, which is text. And if you click on that option, your character responds back to the NPC, whatever you want to respond to them back. When you are in VR, immersion goes out of the window because people usually, when they talk to each other, they don't get a text option of what they should answer back to a person. They just mm -hmm. answer back. When you are in VR, unlike the conventional video game, 
this completely breaks immersion because in VR, you will feel like you are in a real space. And suddenly you get a text in front of your face. It breaks the fourth wall. It breaks completely the whole immersion you have. But now, if you have this sort of way of interacting with NPCs, you just talk to them like we are talking right now, and they respond back. That's so interesting. Do you know if platforms like Unity or Unreal are using AI in their image generation? Unity announced a Unity AI program, which I actually registered to it. They have not revealed it yet, but I suspect that this is going to come very soon. But for now, if you want to experiment by using ChatGDP or some AI, other AI thing, someone took Skyrim VR. Skyrim is a very yeah. popular video game that also has a VR version for it. Someone created the mod, which is a module that is added to the vanilla game and provides further functionality, and which connects to ChatGDP and creates a voice-to-text, also has a voice-to-text module. and this person managed to do what exactly what I just described. So now the non-playable characters in Skyrim VR can have discussions with you. That's amazing. And is yes. that just with this plugin or is that the whole platform? No, it's just a plugin that someone yeah. developed just as a proof of concept. But you can expect that video games from now on will have an infinite sort of story line going on without updates or some sort of team need to write a new story and add a new narrative in them. They will right. go on forever. This is going mm. to happen. It, it's not going to happen in the next two months. This is, I'm talking three or four or five years from now. That's going to yeah. happen. Yeah, but it's starting now. That is such an interesting story. And I know you really keep up with all of the XR news on Inside.com. Are there other stories in XR recently that have been gripping your attention? The massive one is, of course, what's going to happen in June, which is Apple's headset is going to finally be revealed. And there have been rumors for this for ages now. Yeah. They have stalled the launch of this thing for various reasons. And the latest, someone did a 3D model of the headset, which looks very impressive. But if this is true, that's a problem. And it was a known problem. It has an external battery, meaning it has a little box which connects to the headset and you mm -hmm. have it on your side. It was a rumored problem that was going on for quite a while that the Apple headset could only last for two hours. If the latest rumor is true, they did not manage to solve the problem and there will be an external battery with it. How long Ooh. do you think it'll last with the external battery? I don't know. This is not known. But it's a problem. As you can understand, you need to bring it. You have a box with you. It's not a big box. It's not some massive thing. It's a small thing, probably this size, pretty slim too. But uh, I mean, for Apple, if it was any other company, you would say, yeah, whatever. But it's yeah. Apple. You don't expect Apple to do this sort of weird way. Where you can see it working. Apple is yeah. like, you, it's just magic. You don't yeah, know it's, how it's it not works. The magic yeah. is broken here a bit, you'd say. <laughs> And it all depends on what it's going to have, the application is going to have. And, right. But the rumor price is $3,000. I expect this to be the most amazing thing in the world. Wow, $3,000. $3, That's the rumored price. This better be good. What does the I, Quest go for? A few hundred? The Quest is for a few hundred. I think it's 400. The Quest Pro is something less than a thousand. And uh, yeah, this better be amazing for this price. Imagine but, the Apple stores, if they had their VR headsets in there, they're going to be completely bombarded with people. How are people yes. going to try this out without buying it? Yeah. Would you try the, a headset that someone else has tried to? I don't know. I anyway, I'm going gonna, gonna to convince my local library to get one. Yes. For the public. <laughs> yes. For the of course, <laughs> public. So you're pretty convinced that this Apple headset will be revealed in June after all of this delay? No, I'm not. At this point, it has been stalled so many times. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if they do it again, but it would be so bad if they did. It's going to sell. I'm not going to buy it, and a lot of people can't afford it, but there are people, I'm pretty sure every Apple professional developer or company that deals with Apple apps will buy this thing. Apple enthusiasts will buy this thing, definitely. I'm not sure if it's going to be a massive hit like the iPhone, but especially in the first launch, 
but people will buy it. I'm pretty sure it, the question is how better this thing is going to be from the average headset is because right. for so much stalling, so much buzz that has been around it, it needs to be amazing. I'm curious about one bit of technology that's slowly coming into these headsets, and that's eye tracking. What companies are using it and to what extent, do you know? I, I think it's used by, is it from the latest, the Quest Pro? I think it is. What does Quest Pro tell users that they're using eye tracking for? A better gaming experience? Are users worried about the privacy concerns there? It, the eye tracking is not only for VR. It's for AR also. And the advantage for this is, let's say you're walking down the street and the application can immediately understand where your eyesight is focusing, mm -hmm. can project immediately the information on the thing you're focusing, mm -hmm. or even, let's say, keep the information based on what you're interested in and provide you more information about the things you focus more. You can have this sort of thing. Yeah, I can see the application there, not just in entertainment, but in those industries that AR is really being adopted by first industries like healthcare and shipping and all sorts of training. Yes. Let's say you have inside VR a digital actor. An important part of understanding how they should react to you is or where you're looking. It's another point that has to do with immersion and how you can deal with truly making the feeling of VR as a real space with real actors in it. What are the other future characteristics of XR as a whole that you're most excited about? For me, in my opinion, the killer app for VR. It's not only gaming, it's social VR. There is already social VR and it's VR chat and special IO, yes. But they haven't managed to solve yet the major problem of hardware, the fidgety part of VR. There is no VR right now. You can take the thing, you put it on your head and you're done. It's not a thing yet. It's very important. This needs to be solved. And the other thing is, as I said, social VR. If someone manages to create a truly great social VR experience that's open to everybody in an easy way, I think this is the next big tech company. Is it possible that company would be an education company or would they only be after this big social VR platform for entertainment purposes? I don't know. It could be an education company that eventually breaks this problem and becomes something more. I can tell you this from my experience with VR because I have used it for social VR a lot. I spent so much time in Outspace VR and the experience I had with the Burning Man VR event was amazing. I can tell you that there are moments, if you go beyond the fidgety hardware and all the weird technical issues and the glitches and all that, there are moments in VR that are so vivid and so strong that you can compare them with any strong person-to-person -person experience you mm -hmm. had in your life. But they mm -hmm. are so rare because of the other issues that exist around the glitches, the technical stuff. If someone manages to solve this and remove all these problems and create a true social VR experience that's easy to get into, and traverse through the worlds that exist and allow people to easily create their own worlds and connect with each other and connect these worlds and seamlessly go through them and connect with other people. That's going to be the most... Facebook and Twitter will be just little ghosts of the past. If mm -hmm. someone manages to do this, hmm. I don't know who will, but if this happens, this is going to be really big. I... Just did a demo with Runway ML, the video AI company, and this platform that you're describing, it's got to be AI heavy for oh, yes. unending iterations where yes. users can just create their own 3D environments. Yes. Create their own 3D environments, create their own actors, their own scenarios in there where they can live and experience with others. And this is going to happen, I don't know. Who is going to do it? I don't know. Whoever does it is going to be the next big tech. I'm not kidding.
There, the yeah. People won't get enough of this. You will have to drag them out. It could potentially become a problem because people will live their lives in this. There's Ready Player One. <laughs> yes, yes, it will happen. When, yeah. who, I don't know, but keep an eye for that. <laughs> yeah. I think that your YouTube channel does provide a really great glimpse into what the future will hold in social VR. Any industry that wants to have a VR presence, they have to know that video games are the entryway into VR yes. for everyone. Well, not only the entryway, the language of video games is what's going to be both for AR and VR. It's the 3D models, it's the way narrative is built. It's the way you create a character that's not in the uncanny valley. Video games are very good in creating characters that look lively. That's not easy to make. And they have all the experience and all the work behind it. All this visual language and audio language. The way that environments are built. The way the environment it projects a story to the user. All this is video game stuff. These, these sort of tricks, let's say, apply to everything, to VR applications that have to do with the education, to VR applications that have to do with the medical stuff, all mm -hmm. this stuff. We say, but video games, yes. Yeah. If you want to create a patient in VR that's lively and it reacts in a way that the doctor will feel like they have a person, it needs to follow the tricks that we learn from video games to do that for characters in video games. I know it's Definitely. weird, but that's how it is. It's so true. So can you tell us where we can go to follow along with your journey, what your YouTube channel is, what other things we should check out of your online presence? Well, my YouTube channel is uh, Lina Liberopoulou, if you find it. How many hours did this particular one take to build? This is the first one. The Agora is the first one. If you put the research in, it's to two and a half months to make. Wow. Amazing. This really is like your contribution to the world. And I think it's so cool that you're so uniquely suited to it. I'm so grateful that you're sharing all this online and on inside.com. Thank you so much for talking about it all with me. Sure. Thanks for watching. And of course, if you want to connect with Lita and other XR enthusiasts and professionals, you can check out inside.com slash XR. We'll see you next time.